So let's start with, the, with our panel. And uh, we have uh, distinguished um, the, uh, representatives from uh, different countries, ministers, and high-level uh, officials. And they, are, they will discuss uh, science policy uh, in their countries for sustainable um, uh, future of the world. I may start with a few comments that the global warming resulting in, clay, in climate uh, crisis is the most challenging global event for the coming years. Mitigation and uh, adoption are essential to allow uh, continued normal uh, life in, in, in Earth. Recent um, uh, fundamental research, scientific breakthroughs including gene editing, mRNA uh, vaccination, and biological drugs, AI, quantum research, um, photonics, space science, and uh, tissue engineering pave the way for dramatic transformation to technologies that, and, knowledge, and, uh, and knowledges that should help mitigate and adopt climate changes. No doubt that uh, science and innovation can offer non-carbon uh, emitting energy, functional food for the, for the growing population in the world, more effective transportation, etc., etc. Academic research is already international and uh, interdisciplinary. We publish papers, we attend conferences, and we spend sabbaticals in other laboratories. However, the translation of the scientific and innovation uh, findings into products is less often, is less open, and great ideas may be lost. Global collaboration from basic science to applied industrial production of valuable uh, solutions is essential these days. HFSP is a great platform to encourage and coordinate global collaboration and focus efforts to save the planet. This event is uh, representing well this uh, concept of HFSP, and thanks to uh, Pavel and his team for uh, having this conference and to have the, uh, the concept of moving from basic science to applied research as, an, uh, as a concept that will lead to a better, better world in the near future. Now I would like to call the uh, panelists. I will start with the first panelist that will talk a few minutes about his, their policy, um, Stefan uh, Lucas, Deputy Minister of Health in Canada. Thank you. Je suis heureux d'être ici au nom to be here today on behalf of the Ministry of Health in Canada and to see many of our, of our colleagues with which we have our important collaboration in, in science in this beautiful place. It's been in the Human uh, Frontier Science Program since its inception. And we're committed with uh, the partners in this room and program to global research cooperation and both basic and applied transdisciplinary research including at the intersection of life sciences, climate, environment, and sustainability. I think this is a timely discussion today, and we've heard the connection with the UN uh, International Year for Basic Science for Sustainable Development. Um, but as well as uh, other panelists have uh, outlined, there's a need for urgency as we look ahead to uh, the 2030 SDGs, um, but as well the mid-century goals uh, for climate change. I think there's also an opportunity to look to apply the lessons we've, we've all learned in, in our individual uh, communities and countries from the pandemic on the need for speed and agility, including in research and the sharing and publication of results, for the rapid application of new discoveries and basic research underpinned by long-term investment and patient work on areas that, uh, discoveries that come to the fore in times of need as we saw in the pandemic. Uh, for global cooperation in research, but as well in the application and response 
uh, of discoveries and for community engagement and partnership. I'm gonna to touch briefly on three examples to illustrate some of these points. Uh, the first being uh, looking at a One Health approach, second touching on health and climate change, and the third on nature-based solutions. In terms of One Health uh, approach, the pandemic reinforced the importance of understanding interactions between environmental health, animal health, and human health through integrated uh, systems approach uh, based on research, analysis, and modeling. Very much a holistic approach, as other speakers have noted. There's obviously a number of, of important uh, implications of this, including the strategic significance of understanding climate change and global movement and migration as drivers for the spread and scaling of infectious diseases. It also calls for transdisciplinary research in understanding system dynamics and evolution and are preparing for and responding to risks. Thinking back to the pandemic, we saw tremendous advances in surveillance, which is critical, including through wastewater, uh, predictive modeling and vaccines, using, as many have noted, uh, the new uh, mRNA platform, and the application of artificial intelligence, for example, in monoclonal antibody treatments. But underpinning this were decades of uh, investment in basic uh, research that led to some of these breakthroughs, including research by uh, Canadian scientists on lipid nanoparticles. On the second example of health and climate change, here the focus is understanding the impact of climate change on health and adaptive responses. It has both basic and applied, and importantly short and long-term uh, 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 areas of focus. As we look to how to build resilience in our health systems, communities, in the population, and in particular to protect vulnerable populations, recognizing uh, health inequities. This is an area of focus for Canada through our integrated national adaptation strategy, underpinned by research in a number of uh, domains on extreme heat, not only seeking to understand physiological responses, but also behavioral responses and the impact on the mental health of uh, populations, including from uh, climate-induced conflict and, and displacement through uh, migration. Understanding climate-resilient health systems, and this is an area where Canada is cooperating uh, in co-chairing a, a global panel with the Côte d'Ivoire um, in, um, in helping advance this work. And uh, the final example I'll note is in regard to uh, food security. And here we need to not only understand it through the lens of our uh, scientific understanding in a transdisciplinary way, but through the integration of indigenous or traditional knowledge, for example, from the Inuit in the Arctic. Um, here there are opportunities to advance this work uh, with global partners through the International Joint Initiative for Research on Climate Change, Adaptation and Mitigation. The final example I'll note is on um, the impacts of climate change on global biodiversity, which are well documented, although the understanding of those systems and the tipping points has, has been noted, um, requires further research and understanding, uh, not just at a basic, but a, a translational uh, or applied a scientific di uh, d dimension. I think here um, there is an important focus as on looking at nature-based solutions, recognizing the risks are enormous to disturbing natural systems, such as in Canada through the degradation and loss of carbon sinks in the peatlands. Um, research in building uh, uh, critical biodiversity loss and impacts on peatlands and permafrost into climate models is essential to understanding uh, the dynamics of those huge uh, systems looking forward, as well as investing in natural climate solutions. Um, we also need to look at that in, in human um, influence sectors, such as the agriculture sector, recognizing the fundamental importance of food security and uh, supporting research and, and climate action on farms. An example is building resilient uh, agricultural landscapes, uh, valuing ecological goods and services to restore and maintain uh, grass and west wetlands, which in itself requires transdisciplinary research integrating ecological, economic, and behavioral perspectives. So I'll conclude uh, underlining three points. Um, first is the need for a long-term sustained investment and focus on integrated uh, transdisciplinary research that breaks down barriers and re rewards uh, work that cut across uh, boundaries. Um, this needs um, both basic and applied dimensions and a pull function from citizens and, and governments in terms of 
uh, its application and, and driving the timeliness of, of results. Uh, second area is on the, the critical importance of global cooperation and, and collaboration. And, and programs such as the Human Frontiers and Science Program are essential to that and to maintaining for the long term. And the third point is just to underline the critical importance of, of urgency, looking for opportunities to how we can accelerate uh, research, learning from the lessons of the pandemic, to collaborate and ensure research results are published uh, broadly and openly accessible. And third, to consider the distribution of global benefits uh, from research so that all parts of the world can benefit. Thank you, Stefan. And now, Esaine uh, Razzo, Deputy Director General, Research and Innovation European Community Commission. Dear delegates, participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's wonderful to be here with the leaders of the global science community. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, l'Académie des Sciences uh, for hosting us, and also the French government for the support of this uh, conference. The title of this high-level summit is Fundamental Life Science Meets Climate, Environment, and Sustainability. Uh, in my short intervention, I'd like to underline the importance of international collaboration, uh, meeting uh, in order to really respond and also cope with the global challenges that we are all facing. And I would like to claim that uh, the European Research and Innovation Framework Programme Horizon Europe is actually bringing together uh, fundamental life science, meeting climate, environment, sustainability, and even more than that. And this is certainly something that we see in the HFSP, and that's why we continue our support to HFSP. We always need to be open to the world as international collaboration in research and innovation is a, a big strategic priority uh, for the EU. Uh, Jules Hoffmann mentioned uh, the European Research Council, which is an integral part of Horizon Europe Framework Programme. Uh, this is the program with a budget of nearly 100 billion euros for seven years, and as such is, I believe, globally largest collaborative research program. Thanks to its global outreach, the predecessor program was able to attract world-class talent involving researchers, scientists, and innovators from no less than 137 third countries, in addition to those who were associated to the program. Now, with the current program, we open the possibility to be associated for the first time to the like-minded leaders of research and innovation worldwide, in addition to the 16 countries which are already fully associated. New Zealand will be the first country in this new wave uh, to be associated. We have very advanced negotiations with Canada. Uh, we hope to start very soon negotiations with South Korea and Japan, by the way, is also among the countries who have officially expressed interest, and there could be a few others. Such a global approach entails values that are enshrined and support with the HFSP too. Horizon Europe tackles climate change, helps to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and boost EU's competitiveness and growth. The EU research policy has always given huge support to basic science. We fund basic science primarily through our European Research Council, 
At the same time, other parts of the program have been supporting basic science for many years, such as the contribution to HFSP, via the health cluster, and also funding global science data infrastructures. Now, let me just give a very concrete example of the synergies between the uh, different programs and also the importance of the transdisciplinary uh, uh, approach. Uh, let me just put one scientist in particular in spotlight as an example for the uh, brilliant, for all the brilliant HFSP researchers. Michael Cree has just won an HFSP grant with the title Intercellular Selection and Dynamics of Mitro, uh, Mitochondrial Aging. But he has also been an ERC grant holder and Maurice Klodowska Curie Action winner. The beauty of the research stands in the capacity to interconnect research areas completely different, such as mechanics, engineering, and biology. So yes, transdisciplinary is a successful key. I hope there will be also the other points that we can address uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion, but many thanks for your kind attention so far. Thank you very much. And now uh, Tera Schwetz from the NIH. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today with so many distinguished scientists and thought leaders uh, from all around the world. I'm glad to speak to something that the US government holds as critical, and that's the intersection between basic fundamental research and its impact on health and sustainability. Basic research, which is enabled by the US government, including through both the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, provides the building blocks for innovations that will be needed to tackle the grand challenges facing the world. Challenges such as feeding the planet sustainably, limiting the spread of infectious diseases, and coming up with solutions to mitigate climate change. Working with partners within the US and around the world, we recognize the importance of this work now more than ever, especially following the global public health crisis that was the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, U.S. government agencies have just completed the first phase of our response to U.S. President Biden's executive order that outlined policy for a whole of government approach to advance biotechnology and biomanufacturing. And this centered on principles of equality, ethics, safety, and security that enable access to technologies, processes, and products in ways that benefit all Americans and the global community. The policy includes engaging the international community, so hopefully all of you, uh, to enhance research and development cooperation to promote best practices for safe and secure biotechnology and biomanufacturing research, innovation, product uh, development, and use. But concrete steps are needed to shift these policy goals into outcomes to demonstrate impacts on health. Basic and mechanistic studies are key to uh, areas of science that the US government will focus on to address health challenges resulting from climate change. Now, for example, just last year, the NIH launched the Climate Change and Health Initiative to develop the knowledge communities necessary to adapt and prevent uh, future and further harm from climate disasters. The initiative is funding transdisciplinary biomedical research and training to build a diverse workforce that can identify risks, optimize mitigation health uh, benefits, and develop adaptations to climate change. The National Science Foundation has likewise launched an ambitious new Global Centers program to support innovative, collaborative, international centers for interdisciplinary use-inspired research on climate change and clean energy. And this was done in partnership with Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom. 
And the program will prioritize research collaborations, uh, fostering team science, community-engaged research, and knowledge-to-action frameworks. The U.S. government will continue to build upon these efforts and hopes to grow partnerships with other nations along the way. Now, all of these efforts working together will help reduce the burden of climate change and on populations all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Gad Ariely from the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Israel. I will be short because of the climate changes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Israel is investing in science and technology to, to mitigate climate change in various of aspects. We prioritize R&D to the field of renewable energy, such as uh, photoelectric photo and hydrogen technologies food security and climate monitoring systems. We encourage international collaboration to find global solutions to climate changes. And I think that we have to do more and we have to talk less and to work more. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Gadi. I hope that the next speakers also will accept your <laughs> opinion. Or Claire uh, Gay, if you can continue. Dear delegates and participants, it's very difficult for me to, to speak after this uh, <laughs> very conclusive uh, <laughs> proposal, which I, I agree uh, a lot. Uh, well, first, um, it's really wonderful that uh, HSFP has been able to, uh, to have such an assembly today to discuss about uh, this issue of employing basic science to support transformation to sustainability. Uh, since we're in Paris and in the Institut de France, I found it really interesting to remind you that studying the mechanism underpinning the two-step growth of bacterial colonies led to understand the regulation of gene expression and of the role of messenger RNA, leading to a Nobel Prize awarded in 1965 to Jacques Monod, François Jacob, and André Lvov. Sixty years later, the RNA technology gave us a solution to the COVID pandemics. Isn't it a beautiful example of how basic sciences can contribute to durability? Supporting the transfer from basic discovery to innovation represents a major challenge for science policymakers in any country, among other because the potential impact of basic discoveries cannot always be anticipated. Funding uh, basic research is a strong need, no discussion about that. Um, supporting uh, a tool like HSFP, sorry, uh, and international cooperation is an evidence also for France, but it's not enough. We also need instruments to boost translation and innovation to include technology transfer and innovation, innovative uh, innovation institutes, sorry, supporting the transition from the high technology, uh, from, uh, from low sorry, to high technology readiness levels, as well as funding mechanisms supporting innovation and containing the financial risk for innovation investment. To boost the transforming impact of, of science on grand challenges, France recently allocated a substantial uh, financial support to priority equipment and research programs to support low tier researches in areas of potential technological, economical, societal health, or environmental uh, challenges. And changes. Uh, this includes, among other, hydrogen technology, batteries, advanced energy generation, sustainable cities, and so on. Many topics relevant for uh, sustainability and for uh, transition um, issues that we're facing. Uh, this example of our research policy uh, chose to encourage research in dedicated fields, but for a whole continuum, from basic research to the link with industry. The excellence of science is, of course, a major prerequisite for efficient innovation and implementation of research outcomes. 
Besides goal-oriented research institutes, programs, and funding bodies, we need to have various tools as uh, uh, science policymakers to be able to encourage uh, science to support transformation to durability. First, to always support fundamental research as a basic uh, basis of uh, knowledge that can in any moment reveal some potential for durability. Having instruments for curiosity-driven research, uh, which is not synonymous to uh, fundamental research. Having instruments and incentives to respond to societal challenges like uh, these huge transitions that we are facing. Um, Cross-fertilization of disciplines, of several of us mentioned it, uh, to innovate, the best innovative research uh, to face these challenges from, from, the front, from, from the confrontations of complementary skills, that's for me very important. We need to recruit the best young researchers, that's a real chance for us all because they're really motivated by these issues and ready to work above the, the different silos that we can sometimes have between the various disciplines. And last uh, issue, uh, I really want to um, advocate for the work, uh, to associate the work with all stakeholders. Uh, I think uh, the value of associating the end users of research, uh, all the concerned stakeholders from research to uh, the um, other parts of the society that can be concerned has proven its efficiency. Uh, I wanted to mention some of these guidelines and we'll really be happy to listen to all the other inputs on uh, these important questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. I did, I did mention that uh, she is the Director General of the Ministry of Innovation, Science and uh, Technology. Oh, sorry. She's uh, the Director General of the Ministry of Higher Education and Research in France. And the next speaker is uh, Otoli Laser, Chief Executive UK Research and Innovation. Thank you very much. It's really uh, an honor to be here at this iconic meeting built very much on the core principles of the Human Frontiers Science Programme, which is science at the frontiers, but science sans frontiers. And I think that combined um, adventure is a really important um, element that we need to capture in driving forward the urgent solutions we need to the many challenges that the world faces. So I have the privilege of leading UK Research and Innovation, which is the UK's main public sector um, funder of research and innovation. We invest about half of all the public funds um, that go into research and innovation in the UK. Um, we are currently celebrating our fifth birthday. Um, we were formed by bringing together nine different organizations that span all disciplines and all sectors. So from the arts and humanities through to the engineering and physical sciences, from uh, academia and uh, public sector institutes through to businesses, um, large and small. And this bringing together of all the parts of the system, I think, is now clearly part of the global trend. And it is driven, at least in part, by exactly the question that this session is aiming to address. How do we maximize the benefits of basic science to solve the urgent sustainability challenge that we are facing globally? And uh, I think for as long as I've been in research, there's always been this idea that somehow or other there is a, a segregation between basic research and applied research and, and innovation. And unless one keeps that segregation, defends those frontiers, um, we would have a, a challenge in keeping the investment going in across that system. And I think we have to bring those walls down now. That kind of zero-sum game mentality of competition between those areas is incredibly unhelpful for making sure um, that the extraordinary discoveries of basic science can very rapidly connect up to the problems we're facing in the world. So shortening that distance so that problems can very rapidly find solutions is, is absolutely critical. And as part of that, uh, last year we published our first strategy, a five-year strategy, and it is built
built on four principles for change, and I think these are, are um, key to the, the challenge that we're, we're discussing today. The first of those principles is diversity, by which I mean all kinds of diversity, diversity of people, institutions, ideas, funding types, infrastructures. We need to think about the full diversity of activity that we need from the simultaneous translators here in this conference through to the new PhD students entering um, the, the research community full of hope for the future. All of those people um, are important. All of the different institutions and endeavors to which they uh, need to contribute are important. Diversity, absolutely critical. Having said that, diversity is no good whatsoever without connectivity, which is the second principle for change, and I think is one of the most pressing challenges we face as a community. We have not been good at investing in, incentivizing, as Marsha was talking about earlier, um, connectivity across that system, and I would emphasize in particular um, uh, connectivity brought about by diverse career paths so that people entering the system in one place move across it and through it, bringing their expertise and their networks with them. And so really incentivizing career path diversity I think is critical to this challenge, and I don't just mean between academia and industry, I mean all the communities that uh, are necessary for this to work, so the policy community, the investor community, Community, the uh, communications communities, all of those people um, are, are part of this grand endeavor, need to feel part of that shared endeavor, and need to be working together, exchanging ideas and people all the time. So um, just the, the, the second, I mean, the third to uh, the third and fourth uh, principles for change. Third is resilience, which comes at least partly from connected diversity, but we also need to think hard about making sure that we have enough capacity in our system for agility. And then the fourth, really critical, has also been mentioned uh, today, which is engagement. This has got to be a shared endeavor across all of society. Um, in the UK, there's a very popular um, trope at the moment of the, the science superpower. I like to define that as a society that is both powered and empowered by science. And that is clearly something that is not just about nations, it's about, um, uh, it's an international global opportunity to bring people with us to find the solutions to the problems we're facing and fundamentally to, to give people hope. So um, how are we actually doing this? What does this mean in the context of, of how we work as a research funder? Um, we have to support that diverse, dynamic, creative research and innovation base and connect it up as quickly and as critically as we can with the problems that, um, it, that all of that knowledge is, is relevant to solve. This is not just about knowledge push or innovation pull. This is about a fully connected system so that those ideas bump into each other um, in the way that allows the solutions to be found. Um, I'm going to give one example of the, the kinds of things that we're doing. We look right across our investment portfolio, across all of those nine organizations, and we can see we're investing about 800 million pounds every year into climate change relevant um, research. Lots of bottom-up basic stuff, some more targeted applied stuff, huge portfolio. We can now ask ourselves as one organization, what's missing, how can we plug the gap? And we've reserved then a small budget, relatively small budget for gap plugging and also for community building, so connecting um, across uh, uh, the government, across all the ministries in the government, Department for Transport, um, Food and Rural Affairs, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, right across government, um, and meeting the policy needs through our investment, but also right across the world, um, globally, and of course between all of those communities that I mentioned earlier. So um, three examples of things we're funding, one already mentioned is global centers, um, uh, the collaboration with the US, Canada, and Australia. Um, we're also establishing a center for sustainable and equitable low carbon living to provide advice into government as to how to make these transitions, all of the ones that we've heard so well about um, already today, and critically um, including a um, evidence synthesis, which is one of those connecting activities that I think we underinvest in as a community. And then uh, uh, the third thing, uh, a, uh, a lot of work um, right across um, sub-Saharan Africa to investigate the feasibility and scalability of nature-based solutions across all of those um, elements that we've talked about before, rivers, forests, wetlands, and so on. So just, you know, 
tiny example of the kind of thing you can do if you are thinking about connectivity across the system. And I think um, if I had to pick a silver bullet, I'm kind of against the principle of silver bullets because the whole point is we have to do many things. If I had to pick one, it would be connected diversity and what we can do to drive that fully connected diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Atolim. Thank you very much for your nice words. And now, Alejandro Adam, the chair of the uh, governing board of the Global Research Council. You have to explain what it is. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here um, to talk to you a bit about the Global Research Council. First, I want to congratulate uh, the Human Frontiers in Science uh, program. Uh, Canada uh, has, was a founding member, and we're very proud to support such an illustrious uh, program that has had such a big impact. And I do want to acknowledge the support of Japan and uh, of Japanese colleagues for uh, making that possible, and of course the hospitality uh, we've received here in France and in this uh, wonderful location. So, uh, so I am the chair of the Global Research Council. You might wonder, what is that? Well, it's an um, organization that's comprised of the heads of science and engineering public funding agencies from around the world, with over 100 countries represented. Our collective vision is that research and innovation play a leading role in providing the solutions that society needs to overcome global challenges. And I'm very much of the opinion of, about this dichotomy between basic or pure research and applied research really is a false one. I think it's a continuum. Uh, science is science, and we wanted to achieve results. And some of the best um, so-called pure research comes from looking at thorny problems uh, arising from nature. Our mission is to work together to create the conditions in which international research collaboration can thrive. For example, by adopting common principles and practices to ensure that quality, integrity, and ethical behavior lie at the heart of excellent research and development connecting research results, policies, strategies, and targeted initiatives on a global scale opens possibilities to breakthroughs capable of significant impact. In large part, the solution to many global challenges, including those of the UN SDGs, could be met by good public policy connected with new knowledge and novel technologies. The more that research agencies can do to align their practices, strategize their resources, and facilitate the global network of knowledge, the more successful our societies will be at developing solutions to the challenges faced by humanity. To that end, organizations participating in the GRC have agreed on a series of principles to facilitate international cooperation and collaboration among its members and with other international stakeholders. GRC agencies are spread all over the world amidst diverse social, cultural, and economic backgrounds. As such, these organizations are driven by quite distinct views, strategies, and programs for supporting the creation of knowledge, technology, and innovation. Some agencies support mainly bottom-up, basic research. Others focus on top-down, mission-oriented programs. This of course, is, a notion, is part of the notion of diversity that the previous speaker mentioned, and we consider it a strength of the GRC, and that can be very advantageous in focusing efforts to face the diversity of challenges. The GRC is and will remain a forum for public research funding agencies to share principles and best practices, but we're also moving forward towards a more active role in facilitating collaboration within participating agencies and other international stakeholders. Let me mention a couple of initiatives. In one initiative, a group of 11 GRC participating agencies gathered to launch the SDGs pilot program with the aim of applying results from existing research funding programs to solve challenges described in the UN SDGs. The program has received more than 200 applications and is in the last phase of the evaluation process. Uh, our colleagues in Sao Paulo, FAPESP, have organized a mapping exercising showing that several tens of thousands of projects funded by GRC organizations that have had connections, have, have connections to one or more of the SDGs. So formalizing the role of science and science agencies in dealing with SDGs is an important objective. I also want to mention uh, a project initiated by my colleagues in Canada on climate change mitigation uh, through the New Frontiers and Research Fund 
which has over a dozen countries participating from all over the world in uh, dealing with climate change in a transdisciplinary setting. Uh, during a recent meeting of the GRC, participating agencies endorsed a statement describing the principles that the public research funders should apply when funding climate change initiatives. These principles include stating that solutions, technologies, and innovations should be made public and follow open science procedures. The idea that social, economic inequality, and gender discrimination affect more negatively certain social groups, which should be taken into consideration by funders. The position that traditional cultures and indigenous populations have specific knowledge that can contribute to solutions for a more sustainable and inclusive relation between societies and ecosystems. Many of these aspects surpass the realm of climate change funding perspective and can be seen as elements to be included in all research related to SDGs. The challenges are global, but for the collaboration to be effective, a diversity of science and innovation systems around the world must be taken into consideration and mechanisms must be created to help fulfill this task. If science, technology, and innovation are going to have significant impact on global challenges, then we must align our efforts and allot resources for these endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And now, uh, Mosa Moshabella. He is the chairman of the National Research Foundation at uh, South Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed guests, um, delegates. Um, I was expecting everyone to use paper, but use an electronic device, but there's a lot of paper. Tara, I saw you use a, a device. Um, I'm impressed, um, but I'm sure that we are recycling. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, our Minister of Higher Education, Science, and Innovation in South Africa, who unfortunately could not be here, but uh, has sent uh, me to make uh, give this message. We, as South Africa, are very excited to be now included for the first time in the Human Frontier Science Program. And we are the first African country to be included. And I'm saying first because I am hoping that many other African countries would be included. Uh, I am not alone. Um, I am here with uh, our two leading research councils that have uh, facilitated this success for our country. Um, the President um, and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council, Glenda Gray, is here. The Vice President, Dr. Zulke, is here. The CEO of the National Research Foundation, Fulu Nelomondo, is here. And the Deputy CEO is also here, Dr. Lotring. We are very honored to be, to be included. We are very honored to be here for the first time. We are hoping that uh, this uh, inclusion will also help to stimulate and facilitate uh, advances in, in science in, in South Africa. We, we are working very hard to um, improve our national science system, our innovation uh, system nationally. Um, COVID really played an important role in facilitating increased investments in the national science system. And I think many of you would uh, remember the role that South Africa played in identifying some of the variants uh, during COVID-19, even though we were penalized for it um, globally. Uh, we are not holding any grudges, we are forgiving. We do hope that uh, the, the arrival of South Africa on the national, um, on the global uh, scale is going to be welcomed by communities such as this one. We are working very hard to build and enhance our research infrastructure. Early this month, we launched a major um, South African uh, isotope facility for nuclear medicine, nuclear physics, and nuclear sciences in order to ensure that we support the diagnosis, treatment, um, and um, management of cancer. 
and we, we send this and export these isotopes all over the world. Um, we also have a major program in the form of the um, SKA, um, which uh, Sky Kilometer Area, which is really about the um, the space science and astronomy work that we are doing. And when I'm listening to colleagues here talk about that, I feel very proud that South Africa is involved in that. And I'm hoping that uh, we can make a major contribution through that program as well. Um, during COVID-19, um, we've seen the role that uh, South Africa could play in the public health space, in epidemiology, in genomics. And um, we are hoping to launch soon a new institute of uh, pandemic uh, preparedness through the National Research Foundation, the Department of Science and Innovation, and other, other players. The message from our minister is that um, we, we request from partners in this community to enhance and enable um, multilateral partnerships and bilateral partnerships in order to support South Africa and, and other African countries in terms of uh, building framework for cutting edge science, um, including um, making sure that uh, there is mobility of our early career scientists, um, including uh, making sure that there is mentorship and support for them to be able to engage in uh, top science uh, research. We're also hoping that uh, we can continue to support public-private partnerships um, and the quadruple helix in making sure that science can have the necessary societal impact. We are working on building institutional capacities um, in the various, through various research councils and institutions in South Africa. And uh, we are also hoping that generally in the global uh, landscape, we can see a shift in attitude um, towards um, Africa um, to make sure that there's a lot more inclusion, uh, less discrimination, uh, recognition that there's uh, talent uh, on the continent, and uh, that uh, other doors can also be opened and uh, our scientists can be included to become major players on the global scene as well. Um, and with those words, I, I would like to once again thank the organization for um, inviting uh, South Africa to be part of this. I want to thank uh, our research councils for pushing and working very hard behind the scenes to ensure that this happens. And, um, and I'm hoping that uh, South Africa will arrive on the global scale and uh, begin to participate. And hopefully one day we will have uh, Nobel Prizes in science coming from Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mosa. And uh, the last speaker is Marco uh, Boa. And he is uh, Italian attaché for science here in France. Thank you. I will try to be very fast. Uh, it's not easy to take the floor in this uh, high level context that is not mine for sure. So I'm a bit scared also. Uh, I'm uh, giving these uh, words on behalf of the, the Ministry of Research, uh, the Italian Ministry of Research that was not able to come here. First of all, I want to acknowledge the world of uh, Mr. Nakasone, because uh, I have to confirm that in the next presidency of G7, Italy will devote uh, quite high attention to basic research and to the human frontier uh, science program. So just to confirming what was said. I think that we need a change of paradigm. We have to consider that humanities, humans are part of a bigger picture. And we have to consider when we develop our uh, policies of uh, science and technology, the rules uh, that came to us from the bigger pictures. One of the most important elements to realize this change of paradigms is human capital. The first thing that we have invested in with in 
creating a new generation of researcher, a new generation of researcher that will have some keywords uh, that can be considered transversal to any research line, biodiversity, sustainability, environment. This must be principles and others like this that must be always present in the mind of the new generation of researchers and in the one that have to develop the technology and science uh, plans and policies. Other pillars that can have a very important role in these bigger pictures are the research infrastructure in which Italy is investing a lot. Research infrastructure are uh, a field in which uh, young researchers can grow and can collaborate with each other. Finally, I want to say that Italy is investing quite a huge amount of uh, effort and money in our um, national plan of res uh, re resilience and recovery. And uh, in this national plans of resilience and recovery, the attention of basic research, the one that we call curiosity-driven research, must play a very important role. Uh, research that can address uh, important uh, and relevant topics and can be uh, uh, also focused on uh, the bigger picture in which we are playing our small but relevant role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions and answers. So we'll leave it for the next meeting. Uh, I may summarize that uh, we all agree that basic science is fundamental for any research or any development, uh, but uh, still we have to consider uh, the future of the world and uh, try to continue our research, uh, basic research, into applied research and eventually to have a product or something that can save life here. Thank you very much.